All right. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Lydia Kraft. I'm a candidate in House District 90 for our upcoming July 14th primary. So let's see, I'm actually going to pin myself for a moment. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so thank you for joining me. I'm excited to be here. I have had a weekly community coming together security on Facebook Live, uh, where we've talked about important issues along with what's happening in our community and what matters. Last week, I was pleased to host Michael Ewell and Mark Ward, and we talked about rubbish and waste management. Uh, so I am back again this week and will be talking about families and what it's like to raise families here in the Midcoast area, as it's a big part of my life and my campaign. But first, just a few updates. Uh, we are quickly approaching our July 14th start, uh, campaign election day. And and for those of you who have not yet requested an absentee ballot, it is not too late. You can go onto my website, LydiaCrafts.com, and there's a link straight to the Secretary of State's website. You can also call the town office and they will mail you a ballot. Otherwise, polls will be open for in-person voting on Tuesday, July 14th. And uh, I look forward to a strong turnout. From what I'm here, we've already had a huge request on absentee ballots right here in the district. I think over 900 Democrats. Democrats have requested a ballot. Uh, so it looks like a great year for turnout. And I think there are a lot of big issues uh, and bond issues to, to talk about and think about. So uh, if you are interested in following my campaign, please go to my website. You can join our mailing list. We'll have some great volunteer opportunities coming up. Uh, this week, we had a ton of help getting our extra yard signs made and distributed. So thank you to everyone who stepped up and helped with that. Uh, we also have some phone banking opportunities. Oh, sorry, something's in my eye. Uh, phone banking coming up, making sure we get out the vote and everyone has a, w a safe way to get to the polls who wants to vote in person on Tuesday, July 14th. And next week, we'll be talking uh, with some local high school activists around climate change and climate action from Lincoln Academy. So be sure to follow me. I think we're gonna host our Facebook Live next Wednesday. Uh, so look for it next week and uh, follow along. We had another chance to um, film a candidate forum on LCTV this week, and it just aired last night. You can go on over to lctv.org. It, uh, it's House District 90 candidate forum, and it's a great opportunity to sort of check out each of the three primary candidates and see what we each have to say, uh, things that make us unique as candidates, and, uh, and share, share what our priorities are. So without further ado, I am going to get back. Uh, so let's see, I had muted you guys. I'll go ahead and unmute you. I am really pleased to have two close friends uh, join us today, Brittany Gill and Sarah Kennedy. And I asked them to come on and talk a little bit about uh, what it's like to raise families in Midcoast, Maine. We are the oldest county in Maine, and so demographically, we you a little bit older. Uh, but there are still a lot of young people who are staying in the area, who are moving to the area, or who are returning to the area after growing up and leaving. Um, so I just wanted to have a friendly conversation about sort of the things that make our community great, uh, what attracts us to this area, and then maybe some of the priorities or changes, things we could improve uh, moving forward and looking at our future. So welcome, both of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lydia. Um, Thank you. you just want to start with just an introduction about sort of how you got to Maine? Yeah, I had a good friend. I think that there has for a long time been a push to have young people come to Maine. And I was at a transition in my life and she said, Brittany, come farm with me. Uh, she has a family farm in Gardner and or Pittston. And so I was there for the summer and pretty soon got sucked into um, the scene in Maine of farming and cheese making and uh, started dating and got married and had kids. <laughs> great. I think that's a great point. Local agriculture has really brought, I know in the sort of the, the chunk of uh, small scale local agriculture, it's brought a, a lot of young new farmers to the state. Um, with apprenticeship programs, so that's that's awesome. Yeah, great. And then Sarah, what about you? Um, I grew up here. Um, 
I uh, went to the University of Maine after going to Lincoln Academy and um, lived in Ellsworth for a little while after that. And then um, for work and school, went to North Carolina and then to California and the whole time been trying to get back here. And we were finally able to. Uh, my husband's from here too, Jason. And um, we just really wanted to get back here to be close to family, um, the support of having family um, and raise kids in this area. We love it here. Yeah. Um, and so, so Brittany, you did not grow up in Maine, Sarah, you did, but you each found your way back. Um, do you want to just quickly, uh, age of your children? Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I have two kids and, uh, one is going to be eight, two days after we vote. Um, so July 16th, <laughs> um, and and then my son uh, turned four uh, in February. So there's two of them. Great, and Sarah? I have a son and a daughter as well. Um, my daughter is seven and she's gonna be going into second grade at Bristol School. And um, Elliot, my son is three. Great, awesome. Uh, so we have met over having children similar ages. My stepdaughter Amelia is 13 and my daughter Kestrel just turned five. Um, and so there's been a lot of overlap, but what are some things that made you sort of, you know, Brittany, you said you came here for farming. What are things that made you stay and want to be here to raise children? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the big things is the community. Um, my husband, I mean, you're talking about the farming apprenticeships. Um, my husband did the carpenter's boat shop apprenticeship. And I find that that's brought a huge number of young people to the area. And somehow many of our friends are maybe not directly connected, but indirectly somehow connected um, to that program. And um, it's there's just you just walk right into the community and and uh, people are excited to help you settle and be here and make your way and um, it's it's that that really um, I think has has kept us here um, of course there's lots of other things we enjoy but that that was the the, the people is is certainly the big push yeah I will second that the Carpenter's Boat Shop is a big kind of source of community in our area. I, long before I met my husband, Kevin, I first came to the area because I had connections with the boat shop. And I think it does sort of expand and grow our community when people um, come in and then are introduced to the, the sort of the fantastic life available in mid coast Maine. Um, Sarah, what about you? You said that you've been trying to get back to Maine when you were living in California. What were things that you kind of kept in your mind of like the, the, the key pieces of life in Maine that you wanted to come back to? For us, it really was being close to family and having kids in an area where they can play outside. Um, my gosh, it's been highlighted so much recently. I have a lot of friends who have young kids in little apartments and in urban areas where they are stuck inside during this pandemic. And it's been heartbreaking to listen to just what a different experience that is for them. I feel so grateful that um, even though there have certainly been some challenges to having kids here right now, um, or just in general, <laughs> this, this whole experience has been tricky. Um, but we can get outside. There's so many beautiful natural areas. Um, and I feel like we have really good support um, for doing all sorts of things um, that are difficult if you're a family that's living um, without uh, a real strong community around you. Um, we love the schools here too. I, uh, I've worked in nonprofit development for a long time um, and worked at a number of public schools in different areas as well. And, and um, uh, we're really fortunate to have um, some really wonderful public and private school options here too, but um, the Big Coast has some really special things going for it for families. Yeah, I, I appreciate both of you sharing sort of the support that is required for raising a family. So Brittany talking about the community and Sarah talking about family support, that it really is about sort of that village that that beyond the, your nuclear family, what it takes for children to grow up and thrive in a community and whether that's, you know, a great daycare provider for us, we sent Kestrel to Chrissy Wager and when Amelia was young, she had Chrissy Houghton, who's now a public school teacher at Fiddleheads. Um, so, you know, that sense of like the people around you who really do create some of that support and whether it's, 
you know, I met a lot of parents at the uh, parenting group at the Lincoln home when Kester was a little baby and we would play and visit with some of the older residents there. Um, that sense of community is so strong because I think, I, you know, and, and disagree if you do, but uh, you know, that isolation sometimes when you're first having children and in your little bubble, it can feel really overwhelming. And I think in rural communities also that where if you don't have that intentional or really accessible group of people, um, I don't know, when I was a young mom early on, it was very overwhelming. And knowing that we had a great public library with book babies and children's time where it was just always welcoming and safe and nurturing for for kids and for families, it made a huge difference for me in our in just that sense of community. Um, and thinking about that, have there been resources, Sarah? You mentioned public school. Um, are there things that make this area strong or kind of attractive for families that you've tapped into? Um, I mean, the libraries is a really good one. We were just talking, um, my kids and I were just talking about how excited we are because the Bristol Library has opened back up for curbside. I believe um, Skidumpa has as well. Um, and just, you know, I can send an email to the local librarian and say, you know, I've got a rising reader, you know, I, I'm totally unprepared with early chapter books. What do you got? And she just, you know, puts out a bag for me. Um, it's just knowing people that are here to um, support us. Um, as a family, we love going out to the farmer's markets on Friday mornings during the summer. Um, there's a lot, people talk about the diversity and, you um, uh, you know, museums and access to all kinds of things if you live in an urban area, but we really have a lot of that here too. Um, you know, you could go to the botanical gardens, you can go to all kinds of different stuff. Um, and a lot of that's driven by the tourism industry here. Um, but I, as a year round resident, um, I really do feel like we benefit a great deal from the infrastructure, you know, that's, that's available. Um, you know, there's, there's really is a lot. Yeah. A I, I agree with that strongly that you know, that tourism, the thing, the pieces that drive our economy really do have kind of a secondary benefit. And uh, those can be, you know, just having phenomenal restaurants and like exploring food in our area or supporting local farms that can, that can thrive throughout the year and into the fall, um, that it does, it makes a difference and supports obviously, uh, you know, the workforce locally. Uh, Brittany, what about you? Things that your family finds like important resources in our community? Yeah, um, I mean, I uh, would speak again about the library, um, but <laughs> I, one of the things I love about uh, like the Bristol Library is that my kids get to know the librarian. Like I love meeting the other parents, but they have a, a, a another adult in their life. Um, that, that they can develop this relationship with. Um, but one of the other things I was thinking about that I really like is um, like the, the music. I, I feel that it is partly driven by um, people coming for the summer or, or from away, but um, both of our kids are taking um, music lessons and their teacher does the um, dances, the um, contra dances once a month and the, there's I think there's a lot of people in the community who have particular passions and particular skills that they just pour it pours out of them um, and it's 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 really neat to be able to benefit from that and and all the energy of of um, say Katie Newell with her musicianship um, so I really I really appreciate that I appreciate that it's you know if you don't you don't have to go beyond sort of the Damascata bubble to get most of your basic needs. Um, that there's plenty of banks and grocery stores and yeah, like you said, um, restaurants and uh, that you can, you can go to Rennie's, get your <laughs> department store goods. Um, that there's a lot to offer within a small radius, um, even if it feels like I'm driving all the time still. <laughs> yeah, right, it's a little spread out, especially if you live down on the peninsula. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I would second that. And also like the YMCA, just the incredible mm -hmm. having a resource like a community Y that does so much. They've been a big part of the Lincoln County Food Initiative. Uh, we were talking about mm -hmm. upgrading Kestrel's bike and I said like they've got this swap system where you can drop off kids 
outdoor equipment on I think Monday or Tuesday and on Fridays you can go and it's free and I was like we should check out to see if there's a bigger bike for her I mean just mm -hmm. that like their goal of getting kids outside and for families and individuals to live healthy lifestyles beyond just exercise classes or basketball teams you know that it is it is so much more also um Kiev Wavis I think uh, offers huge, you know, like monthly climbing wall nights, uh, open gym nights in the winter. I know our family has really enjoyed that. Um, and so we do, right, if that summer camp wasn't there, would it mean the uh, educators and residents? I Kim mm -hmm. supports uh, each of our local AOS schools receives eight to 10 weeks of uh, staffing mm -hmm. each winter when it's kind of the off season. And so- My daughter school. loves it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so just those those resources that really do extend beyond maybe what their targeted audience is or what we think of them and do so much more. Yeah, I work with those educators and residents at the high school, and they are a huge asset for us. It's wonderful to have their just their energy and fresh ideas and experience in outdoor education and leadership come in and, and work hands on with the kids. It's great. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, and so, Sarah, you are involved at the high school level, but I would be curious um, to hear from both of you sort of, uh, you know, education is a big, you know, when families talk about where they want to live, there's often this discussion of schools and education and what their hopes or goals are for their own children. Um, what has your experience been like with local schools? Um, both Brittany and I have kids at Bristol School, um, and I'm uh, really impressed with, you know, so, uh, just there's so much going on there, but, um, and of course, you know, all of Bentley is, is a staff I'm person there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but one of the reasons also that I'm really excited about your campaign is that you've been talking about um, getting pre-K, which is a program that is offered at Bristol School, and I feel like our community is so fortunate to benefit from having that early childhood education available to families in this area. Um, because we have so, my family, I, I'm just working part-time right now, we have a lot of grandparent support with childcare, that whole reason why we moved back. Um, I didn't take advantage of it with my um, with my oldest kid, but it's, um, I know so many families that are um, able to be getting back to work, being able to have that support. Their kids are getting healthy meals um, and great um, interaction with other kids during the day. It seems like it's a really loving, caring program. And there's so many studies that show that that sort of environment for kids in that age group um, just, just makes a tremendous impact for them for their entire lives. And being able to you know, say that's something that Bristol has, um, we have a track record, um, of having that established program um, and hopefully bringing more programs like that across the street um, is something that I'm really excited about. Yeah, that's great. Campaign is something that I hope you can bring, have a great success with. Yes, and South Bristol is opening a pre-K uh, yeah. fall too. Uh, that's my understanding. So that's really exciting. Um, and I do, I mean, I would just put a plug in there. I, I think it's interesting that as a society, we support education, but say legally it starts at six. Um, and like, why don't we support more early intervention and early child care? Because it has such a big impact, uh, predominantly on women and moms and, you know, finding child care and the quality and accessibility and affordability of child care, it varies so much. And I've been super privileged to have a great child care provider, but I know in other rural communities, there are huge wait lists or uh, just not the same level of resource for families. I think pre-K is a great start and I would push for, uh, you know, even more comprehensive childcare because it does so much. And I just see in our own pre-K, like referrals for special education for kids who need some additional services like speech or OT or PT, um, who may not know, right? Like I, we all get into our little bubbles and may not know exactly what's developmentally um, on track and what's not, and to have other professionals to be able to refer, hey, we have these services, they can receive them right here at school. It is so much more than just early literacy, which I think a lot of us think about like, oh, learning your ABCs or counting, like, yeah, it's all of that and more. Um, there, it does offer so much. Um, Brittany, what about you? Well, it's interesting hearing you talk about the, um, uh, looking at special needs uh, my my son was a little bit of a slow start with with speaking, and 
I, my sister is an OT. And so she said, you know, you can get him tested and just find out about it. And I think if I hadn't had her support and her knowledge, I would have never contacted child development services and they were phenomenal. And it turned out that Abe didn't, he, he we had a, a, a couple months worth of, of support, but they made sure like, how is he getting in his car seat? How are you doing at nighttime? They, they supported me as a whole, as a mother, not just him as, as learning his speech. And I, and I feel like, yeah, when you have a public setting, you can find out about these things. Um, and I was just really lucky that I had heard, heard about this through my sister. Um, so I really, yeah, I appreciate that um, in, in school and in, in Bristol school that, yeah, they're wa I feel like they're watching out for the kids. And uh, one of my favorite moments when Alice first started the school, you know, I started public school, I was a little bit nervous, like, how is this gonna go? And it was, I, I forget, maybe um, a weekend early on, we went to the beach and all of a sudden there was my daughter like running off with other kids. I was like, who are you with? And those friends from school. Um, and it's really nice. I mean, that's part of being in this community is that the kids start to recognize each other um, and know that they're in a comfortable space and um, can just go to the beach and find somebody to play with. Um, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And I think also in my experience, it's a great way to build relationships as parents because there are lots of friends I have now through my kids' parents or my kids' friends that uh, you know you kind of get to have access to your friend group. It's uh, it's wonderful. Um, I did. Have, did either of you use healthy families, healthy main families, when kids were really young? I didn't. So I participated in a, in the, I think it's main healthy families and they have home visitors for new parents. Oh. And we did, I think four months of weekly or bi-weekly visits. And it was so great. And they went over all of those developmental milestones and what to expect and brought activities for, for you and your baby. Um, so for anyone who's thinking about having children or having children who's watching this, uh, make sure you talk to your pediatricians yeah. because they make the referrals. Um, and it's free and it's, it's accessible to every family in Maine. Um, and it's, you know, that idea of starting at birth, right? That we support yeah. families. Um, at, with children of all ages. Well, and that's a great point because um, you were talking earlier about um, that there's some real struggles in the beginning when you have, especially your first child and maybe you don't, you have sort of a support network but you're still developing it and, or at least that's what how it was for me. And I just remember crying, going to the doctor's office and they're so, you know, the, the doctors we have here are, are wonderful. Um, and they're more focused on, does your kid look healthy? Yep, good. And, uh, and I really need to like, okay, am I doing okay as a parent? Uh, and having that support, yeah, something like healthy kids, that's really neat that they do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I sort of to move into this idea, and I, I don't know exactly uh, what I'm thinking, but I'm wondering about, oh, it seems like there's an echo. Um, I, I'm just thinking about raising kids and sort of goals or ideas, hopes for your own children. What do you, what would help kids grow up and thrive if your own children wanted to stay and live in this area, what it might look like or what opportunities you might hope your kids have, whether or not they're available right now or that you'd like to see change. Either of you jump at that? <laughs> um, for our family, it was difficult to move back to this area. We had to find jobs that would support us um, coming back here. And so I get excited about new industry in this area. I get excited about um, environmental protections, which I feel like really serve um, the, the agricultural and the fishing industry and the forestry industry in Maine. Um, you know, it's really interesting to think ahead you know it seems really far away but by the time our kids are entering the workforce um it's, it's really not super distant future um and so i think it is really important to think about what we're doing now to build infrastructure for families um to, to grow in this area and i meet so many people like Brittany that that choose 
the mid coast i remember when i moved back here i was shocked i had so many friends from growing up here that left maine um plenty that stay of course but um lots of people that went on to pursue you know, uh, a different sort of environment, a different type of community than what they grew up in. Um, and we're enthusiastic to leave. A lot of them have come back. And then we, I really have met a lot of young families here. There is really a lot to be desired, a lot to benefit from um, moving to Maine um, and being here. But um, I think it is really important to think about how we retain people here. Um, you know, what sort of jobs be technology or um, it, making it more possible for people to work remotely. My husband works um, remotely um, for a tech company. So being sure that, you know, he can, he, we, have, we have great internet access on our road um, through Tidewater, um, but the whole state does not and parts of this county also do not. Um, so making sure that people have the ability to, especially the way that things are going lately, have the ability to, um, access all that they need to do to, um, to be able to provide for their families um, through meaningful employment here is, is a big deal. Yeah, Sarah, do you have fiber internet? Here. What do we have? Um, yeah, I think we do. There's, um, our, our road has uh, very, there's, uh, it, we've gotten early with that, I think. Um, and it's because somebody that lives down at the end of our road um, requested it to be put in and we have uh, benefited greatly as a result. <laughs> so we do yeah, have very high speed. Yeah, for folks who don't know, there's a bond issue coming up on July 14th. It's question one to approve a $15 million bond for uh, expanding broadband internet, which is a huge, I mean, in this conversation specifically, it's a huge piece for working families um, and being able to continue to do your jobs remotely. Uh, but it also affects us economically. I think telemedicine and healthcare are big. And then for kids also accessing remote learning and education, um, you know, as we've seen has required a lot of internet access. And so making sure our state is looking ahead at what, what can we do to develop some more economic incentives for folks to be able to work remotely, like you're talking about your husband, Sarah. Um, I think that's in rural communities. Um, I spent some time looking at Kogis at the VA about 10 years ago, and they were just expanding telemedicine to northern counties. And like the travel time to come down to Augusta for folks up in Holton uh, or Millinocket, you know, that is a huge barrier. So looking, I think we've, we've seen the use of telemedicine expand greatly and that we really need the infrastructure to continue to support it. Yeah, we did a great Zoom video call with Dr. Russ for our pediatrics checkup the other day. It worked really well. Um, it, there, you know, there's applications for all of this stuff. But um, you know, I just felt so fortunate that again we have those sort of relationships with our small town hospital. Um, is doing really great stuff. Um, to to make sure that family checking in with families, making sure that things are going going well during um, difficult times and being able to use um, these sort of technologies to make it happen. It's really cool. Yeah, I, we also use Dr. Russ's office and I've been really impressed. I used to work with Heather Norris, who's one of the behavioral health clinicians and I've been really excited to see that Lincoln Health has integrated mental health services and pediatric medical care um, that families and individuals can see a counselor right in the medical center that you don't have to sort of explore other outside providers that there's someone right there and it's a really warm transition you can meet the counselor if you're interested um, if your child or you yourself need some you know a little bit of help getting through something difficult um, i've been really excited for that development mm. at, the, at the hospital um, yeah, that's awesome. I also think about job training and the types of opportunities kids grow up being exposed to and whether that's um you know, just knowledge of what type of work is out there that you can do certain jobs that you just don't see every day, but also, um, you know, exposure to experiences and vocational training or apprenticeship models of education that, you know, Sarah, you mentioned friends moving away and, you know, I think there will often be youth who seek education beyond, you know, the state borders or want to move down, uh, you know, up to Ordo or down to Portland, um, but that there are also, you know, young people who are open to job skills training right here in Lincoln County. I know the hospital does a great um, partnership with May, uh, Central Maine Community College, I believe, um, with a nursing degree, and so you can work as a CNA and receive 
uh, I think no cost medical training to become a nurse through the hospital because they're, they've really struggled with the shortage of medical providers um, and being able to recruit people. I just wonder um, about expanding that, looking at kind of apprenticeship ideas or ways to, to connect industry and small business with young kids growing up who also want some, want some experience before maybe they jump into more formal job training. Well, I, working with the Community Housing Improvement Project with CHIP, I mean, one of the things I have to do is hire contractors. And I really think about, um, yeah, younger people, that there's a lot of avenues that people want to go, whether it, or might be um, driven towards. And some of those are the trades, some of it might be college. Um, but um, being able to hire people to do plumbing and electrical work. Uh, I had an electrician uh, who retired recently who offered his services and it was like, oh, thank goodness that I don't have to be searching for an electrician all the time. Um, and I, I think there's, there's definitely a need to help take people from high school through different kinds of training. Mm -hmm. And I do have great vocational programs in this area um, between Rockland and Bath. I know um, I've been a part of a lot of the distance learning ed, um, conversations at the high school lately and um, looking at how we can ensure that students are still able to access those sort of programs and have, um, you know, this area serves a really diverse group, a diverse population of students and um, how to ensure that we are able to meet all those needs. Um, and, and access to all these wonderful programs, um, whether it's a leadership program at Kiev Wavis or um, vocational program, um, helping students that have different sort of learning needs. Um, it's really amazing to see a group of educators come together and I assume this sort of stuff happens um, at the elementary level too with Bristol, but um, really problem solving how to provide the best resources for a really diverse group of kids. Yeah, that's so important to realize mm -hmm. that you know, the, our learning styles and our needs around education and learning can vary so much. Um, and, and I love how creative I know Lincoln Academy has been and also some of the local elementary and middle schools are that programming meets the students who are coming in, that there is kind of a program that matches the learning style or the needs um, of kids and adolescents, because I think you know, my biggest fear as a parent is having my child lose interest in education uh, and that, it, you know, that, that fear that it might not be meaningful because I myself have had a great education and I was able to, you know, get my master's degree at, through Orno and was so pleased with the, the education that I've had. Um, and, you know, trying not to put pressure on kids, but also really wanting them to stay engaged and whatever the avenue is, whatever the um, kind of the goal you set for yourself, that there's a means to get there, that, that you can stay engaged and continue your growth in whatever level or to whatever degree that looks like. Um, and I think that takes some flexibility of our school systems and making sure that kids aren't checking out, that kids aren't sort of losing interest um, that it's that school is still applicable to them and and what their world looks like. So I think making that connection is really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's one of the strengths, actually, I think of our school system is that it's small. And like even with reading or math groups, they have very small groups of the kids. They divide the class up. And so I feel like there's a lot of individual attention. And I don't know if it's just because of the class size or because they are hiring enough teachers and aides. Um, but I feel like it's, they're very supportive at, at least the early elementary stage. Yeah. I and I would say our, you know, the Bristol school board and the Bristol community as a whole have been so incredibly supportive of public education mm -hmm. and that the school is really well funded in a very responsible way um, that unfortunately, you know, other rural communities don't have the same tax base that Bristol does as a, with, a, you know, a lot of waterfront and vacation properties um, that, that towns really rely on state funding and that our state hasn't been funding schools at their full 55%. And that's a real, um, that's, that creates a division between the haves and haves nots. And I think that that's 
um, unacceptable in our state. And I think that our leadership should be focused, especially in this economic recovery from our pandemic, making sure that schools continue to be funded and that they should be fully funded because the inequity of education, right? We uh, at the federal level, level, we talk about free and appropriate public education, FAPE, uh, that should be available to all students. And if we're not equally funding schools, we're not uh, we're not putting our resources to to educating all students. So I think there are a lot of pieces in our community that can be looked at as a model for what it what it really looks like to to go that uh, that full you know to provide a full educational experience. Um, and I like the partnership the town also has with Lincoln Academy. And um, I know as a town academy, it's like in this kind of different uh, category of schools, but it certainly does a great job. And we've seen a lot of positive changes uh, just in the 10 years that I've been here uh, in how collaborative the schools are together and making sure we help kids transition from eighth into ninth grade with a solid relationship and that continuity. Yeah, no, I have to agree. Um, it's, uh, there's so many things that are the same and so many things that are different from when I was a student there. Um, and it's a really exciting time to be a staff person there. I feel really supported. Um, I was also, as you were saying that, I was thinking about when I went to Orono, I, most of the other students that I was in courses with were also from Maine high schools, um, but they had had very different experiences. Um, I studied abroad through an AFS program, which was supported and encouraged through Lincoln Academy. Um, and I went on to study international relations and Spanish and it, it served me really well. Um, but most of the other students in the Spanish classes and, um, and uh, yeah, mostly the Spanish classes hadn't even had access to foreign language classes at that time. I know that's changed um, to some extent, um, but they had all pursued other avenues to get to where they were. Um, and the same thing with um, music and you know, the arts and arts programs at the high school level here are really phenomenal. We have some great people in our community, very passionate about teaching um, and very well qualified for teaching. And that's one of the really cool things about my, again, bias, I worked there, but um, and I went there and I love it, but the, um, Lincoln has the ability to really recruit some excellent educators, I believe, um, to really meet the needs of, again, a, just a great diversity of students, um, whether they're looking to take those advanced AP level classes to go on to um, a, an advanced degree eventually, or if they're um, looking to, you know, to maybe do go into a trade industry here locally um, and not go too far from home right after high school. Um, I think that's something we're really fortunate for here and something I didn't realize until I left, really. Yeah, I think some of that perspective is gained when you step away a little bit and have that, that view um, and come back. I know a lot of friends of mine who similarly left for education and um, are really wanting to return back to Maine to raise their families, uh, raise their children closer to family and uh, can look back and really appreciate living in coastal Maine, uh, but are finding it difficult with, you know, the cost of housing and the difference in pay and wages from, from jobs in urban centers that the, the pay adjustment is really significant where our cost of living still remains pretty high and our availability of affordable housing is fairly limited in the area. So I think those are continue to be some of my top priorities also in making sure that we work and live in livable communities that, right? Not only, I think the phrase I've heard a lot is you get to work where you live rather than having to live where you work, that you can choose a life and find gainful employment and be able to support yourself and your family um, because I think that's a that's a main that works for everyone. Yeah. Well I really appreciate both of you being here uh, just in wrapping up any last thoughts about what it's been like uh, challenges or other pluses of raising kids here in District 90. People love seeing kids because there's so many older people here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and that, that's actually a great point. I don't think I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but part of what makes our area so attractive for people who are aging and want to age in a supportive community are the services and the goods that they can access here. And that those services, like you were mentioning, Brittany, that all of those traits people like provide those really important 
services that allow people to stay in their own homes and age in place. And that really, you know, that driving force between behind keeping this a livable community is really uh, the workforce. And that I think there's a place there for young working people to step in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been our experience as well. Um, we have grandparents and great grandparents um, that are here for our kids to connect with. Um, my kid's great grandmother um, lives in the green in Damascata and um, it's been so wonderful to have her so close to home in a comfortable setting. Um, and I know that that organization has been you know, a lifesaver um, and a lifeline for so many communities that are able to keep their um, aging loved ones close by and well cared for. Um, and that's you know, another program I'd like to see replicated throughout the state. I think that's something else we're really fortunate to have here in this area. Um, and it's keeping these families connected um, you know, through all, all ages, all generations. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The green system for folks who don't know about it are really, really centralized. Um, uh, nurse is it full nursing facility care I'm not sure they do they have nurses um I don't know the all the you know the different levels of of care um but it is I believe um on part and uh, to others you know it's not at a hospital where some of the um other uh, more direct care um, nursing facilities are but um yeah they they have nurses on staff um and uh, people there are some of them are living you know fairly independently and, and some need uh, certainly need more assistance mm -hmm. yeah. but anyway it's great to go in there with my kids they've got <laughs> we often go in um, do a little violin performance we haven't been able they have just opened up porch you know distance visiting um, which is we're really excited to get back to doing that um, but uh, it's meant so much to our family that you know that that the grandmother's been able to stay um, close yeah, that is, that's an important piece of keeping families and support networks together when children are young, but also when our parents and grandparents age, um, having that available. A, a lot of folks I talk to are retired and, and talk to me a lot about wishing or wanting their younger families to be able to move here, to be closer mm -hmm. and wanting to be close to grandchildren and um, wanting to make that work for themselves also because Right, young people uh, really strive for that support network as do older aging folks also want that continued support of family and a, a community network. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, great. Um, well, thank you both for joining us today. It's been great to talk and I appreciate both of your support. I'll also just put the, the thank you out there to both of you for helping me with my campaign that I'm transparent. You both have been a huge help and uh, and some people sometimes ask me like, oh, are young families, like are young people really thinking about politics? And I always say like, yes, we are all super engaged. It's just that we can't make it to like an 8 p.m. meeting or something that's happening at dinner time when we have to do baths and, and feed our kids. So I appreciate and respect both of you for being uh, really engaged and part of my campaign. And I appreciate all of your help. Thank you thank so you much, Lydia. Lydia. You're an inspiration. We're really proud of you. Oh, thank you. I hope you have a great weekend. All right. Thank Bye. You. Let's see. All right. Oh, okay. Let's see. I will finish up there and then we'll. All right, so thank you again for joining me. We are just over two weeks away from election day. Uh, we have had great success in reaching voters. This campaign has turned out a little differently than we anticipated, uh, but I've been talking to lots of folks on the phone. I appreciate all of you answering calls, getting back to me, emails, um, and it, it really is truly a campaign that's built on relationships and and really bringing more voices to the table in Augusta. As your representative, I look forward to lifting all of our voices because I think leadership works best for the most people when we hear from everyone and we know how our decisions are playing out and affecting the lives of our community and our constituents. So thank you for joining in. Uh, join me next week for the Climate Action Club from Lincoln Academy. We'll have a couple of student activists join us and talk about climate change and the youth voice in our community. Uh, visit my website, LydiaCrafts.com to learn more and follow me on Facebook. Thanks so much and have a great weekend. Bye everyone.